we shall commence this module by discussing about agriculture. Today, agriculture in developing world is caught in three-way struggle. There is overwhelming pressure to transform the sector via market-driven forces towards the production of higher value added non-traditional crops destined for exports and for urban areas. At the same time, pressures are building to address concern for social justice, including advancing strategies to confront food insecurity, chronic malnutrition and other inequitable land tenure system via land reform. Both are matters that cannot be resolved through market driven strategies. And third, there is a pressure to introduce more environmentally sustainable forms of farm management, including organic production, as issues of soil depletion, high use of pesticide, climate change, deforestation and desertification, soil compaction and increasing water scarcity are treated with greater consideration. Low agriculture productivity and inefficiency arise because of the failure of the factor markets that is land, labor and capital credit markets. The failures of the markets leads to failure of adoption of new technology necessary for increasing agriculture productivity. The failure of these markets mainly arises because of unequal distribution of land, the primary factors of production in agriculture. When land is unequally distributed, there arises the institutions of tenancy. In many instances, there is a violation of tenancy contracts which leads to underutilization of land as well as labor power. It also causes the failure of credit markets. Moreover, unequal distribution of land leads to the inverse relationship between farm size and the productivity. After studying this module, you shall be able to understand reasons for low productivity, know the nature of the green revolution, know the causes of green revolution, know linkages between new technology and sustainable agriculture, know the linkages between new technology and environmental degradation, know the policy suggestions for sustainable agriculture. Now we will discuss reasons for low productivity. The first one is unequal distribution of land. In most of the developing countries, the distribution of land is unequal. Large plots of lands are often concentrated in hands of few, whereas majority of the individuals have little or no land at all. In the countries of Asia and Latin America, a huge percentage of rural population is either landless or owns very small plots of land in contrast with a small fraction of the population who own very large quantities of land. Similarly, there is distribution of labor endowments, although the distribution of land holding is likely to be far more unequal than the distribution of labor endowments. In such a situation, either individuals with excess labor will seek employment with large landowners or land will be leased to small holders or both. The labor market will typically function with large farmers who hire the labor of those with little or no land for a wage. Under this scenario, the agricultural markets clears by allocating labor from those who have little land to those who have a lot. The end result looks like a setting in which large plantations hire large amounts of labor and this labor is monitored by hired supervisor or the owners of the farms. The land markets typically works with tracts of land leased from landlords to tenants in exchange for rent or perhaps the share of the crop. Number two, urban bias and landlord bias. The relative neglect of agriculture is explained by the theory of urban bias. This perspective pioneered by Michael Lipton argues that agriculture receive relatively little attention in implementation of most development strategies as a result of complex of social forces and forces operating both in developing and developed nations. As a rule, the leading economists, strategists and policy makers in 
less developed nations live in capital city and some other major urban area. They have relatively little contact and little knowledge of day-to-day -day activities in the rural sector. Not only are they physically divorced from the rural areas, they are also physically trained in a western academic paradigm which has little concern with our understanding of backward agricultural regions. Development is equated with industrialization and industrialization has been predominantly an urban phenomenon. Hence, this urban bias leads to neglect of the rural agricultural sector. Number three, geographical factors. Geographical factors include climate and terrain that determine to a large degree what goods a country can produce. The amount of cultivable land available per inhabitant and the land's fertility. To some extent, the application of capital to land can compensate for unfavorable natural forces, but there are obvious limits. Mountains cannot be easily flattened or deserts readily watered. However, differences in natural conditions and fertility of the soil can be no more than a partial explanation of low productivity. Poor people are to be found along the highly productive alluvial bank of the Nile as well as on the barren plateaus of Asia and South America. Number four, land labor ratios. Productivity is also affected by land labor ratios. Low productivity may be associated, for example, with a high population density and high ratio of labor to land. In this case, Productivity might be increased substantially with small application of land in the form of drainage schemes, fertilizers and so on. On the other hand, low productivity may be associated with opposite situation of a high ratio of land to labor, in which case the solution to low productivity is likely to involve much larger doses of capital for labor to work with. Most countries in Asia have high ratio of labor to land, while in Africa, the reverse is true. Number five, aversion to risk. A typical rural society consists of rich landowners, peasants, sharecroppers, tenants, and laborers. Apart from the landowners, most others in the rural sectors are extremely poor. Because they live on margin of subsistence, they tend to be risk averse. In most of the developing peasant subsistence farming is traditional way of life and attempts to raise productivity will alter that way of life and necessarily involve risks. Poor people on the margin of subsistence may be reluctant to make the change necessary to improve productivity because if things go wrong, it will spell disaster. But even if poor people wanted to change the traditional ways of doing things, there are serious constraints of lack of access to credit to finance, the purchase of new seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, drainage, and so on. Number six, outmoded agricultural techniques. Most of the Indian farmers continue to use outmoded agriculture techniques. Wooden plows and bullocks are still used by a majority of farmers. Use of fertilizers and new high yielding varieties of seeds is extremely limited. In brief, Indian agriculture is traditional and therefore productivity is low. Number seven, lack of irrigation. Irrigation plays an important role in Indian agriculture. Currently nearly 45% of the 175 million hectare of the country's cropped area is irrigated. Irrigated area has nearly traveled since the early 1950s from around 24 million hectare in 1953-54 to nearly 75 million hectare in 98-99. The gross cropped area is 198.9 million hectares with a cropping intensity of 140.5%. The net irrigated area is 63.6 million hectare in 2010-11 as per land use statistics. According to one recent estimate, Nearly three-fourths of the increment in total crop output between the early 1970s and early 1990s came from expansion of irrigated area and increase in per hectare yield on irrigated land. Unirrigated crop areas have actually declined 
and the rate of yield improvement on these areas has been far slower overall compared to the irrigated areas. This shows that even now about 55% of the gross cropped area continues to depend on rains. Rainfall is often insufficient, uncertain and irregular. Accordingly, productivity is bound to be low in all those areas which lack irrigation facilities and totally dependent on rains. Even in areas having irrigation facilities, potential is not wholly utilized because of effective management. The cost of irrigation are also increasing continuously and the small farmer is therefore unable to make use of available irrigation facilities. The total irrigation potential in the country has increased from 81.1 million hectares in 91-92 to 102.8 million hectares up to the end of the 12th five-year plan. Of the total potential created, however, only 87.2 million hectares is actually utilized. Even after full utilization of the irrigation potential, nearly 45% of the net cultivated area will have to depend on rainfall. As the present agriculture development strategy in India is centered mainly on the irrigated areas and the yield levels of crops in many irrigated areas are plateauing, there is a growing realization that agriculture production cannot be increased beyond a point. The problem of low productivity and inefficacy was largely solved by green revolution technology. Let us now move on to the nature of the green revolution. The green revolution or GR can be explained clearly by looking at shift of the production function of any agricultural crops. The phenomena of the GR has indeed been observed by a phenomenal growth of yields of some food grains in parts of India, Pakistan, Thailand, parts of South and Central America and Philippines during the late 60s and 70s. A noted American biologist Norman Burlaw is the father of GR in South Asia, India who introduced GR to Mexico, India and Pakistan. During the last few years of the 80s, the food grain production in countries like India has surged ahead and yields of a number of food grains have indeed registered significant rise. 151.6 million tons in 1983 from 128 million tons in 1978-79. India is also exporting rice to the world market in recent years. Needless to say, such a transformation of agriculture in LDCs makes a very important contribution by improving the overall rate of economic growth, speeding process of structural change, improving nutrition, efficiency and productivity of labor and leads to the general improvement of welfare. The GR has also facilitated the process of social modernization including the extension of rural education and the decline of high birth and death rates in rural areas by stimulating widespread changes of attitudes among many farmers in LDCs. It is useful to note at this stage that there are at least three elements of a change in yield in agricultural crop per unit of land heralding GR. These are a change in the output mix, a change in cropping intensity and a change in crop yield. Technical change in underdeveloped agriculture can be classified into two broad kinds which are biological and the mechanical. Biological innovations usually refer to factors that raise land productivity. Better seeds and use of organic fertilizers in right doses at the right time are useful instances. Mechanical innovations usually mean the use of more machinery like tractors and are frequently referred to as tractorization. The miracle seed that is the new wheat and rice varieties sometimes refer to the high yield variety that is HYV have been adopted by the farmers in some LDCs at high rates especially in those regions where they are technically and economically superior to local types. In the Indian province Punjab the proportion of total wheat area planted to the new HYVs 
of wheat increased from 3.6% in 1966-1970, the rest of the year of introduction, to 65.6% in 1969-70. We shall now understand the causes of Green Revolution. A large number of factors individually and collectively have played roles in varying degrees of importance in the making of GR. The continuing high growth rates of population in most LDCs during the 50s and early 60s effectively reduced the growth of per capita real income and per capita food availability. As food production barely kept ahead of the population growth rate, the standard of living remained fairly static. In some regions, a decline in per capita food availability has been recorded. Thus, necessity became the mother of invention. Faced with the urgent need of feeding a large number of extra mouths, there was very little choice but to introduce technical progress in agriculture. However, agriculture productivity has remained stagnated for last many years, particularly in the region where green revolution has started initially. It is broadly known as technology fatigue. On the other hand, the Green Revolution technology led intensive use of energy intensive inputs such as fertilizers, pesticides, water, land, seeds, etc., leading to declining productivity in those regions. There is serious damage to both to human health and environment because of intensive use of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, overutilization of ground and salinity of the soil. Sustainability of agriculture has become a threat both from within and external regions. The internal cause is a green revolution technology itself and climate change due to external reasons outside the agriculture. Let us now discuss about the new technology and sustainable agriculture. In India, green revolution which was heralded in the 1960s was a mixed blessing. Ambitious use of agrochemicals and hybrid seeds boosted food production but also destroyed the agricultural ecosystem. The sustainable agricultural policy aims to promote technically sound, economically viable, environmentally non-degrading and socially acceptable use of country's natural resources such as land, water and genetic endowments. The challenge relating to Indian agriculture is to maintain its fertility status and protect against degradation due to soil erosion, chemicalization, water logging and salinization and alkyl problems. In the case of degradation of cultivable land, the problem seems to be less complex as compared to the wastelands. In some cases, use of chemical fertilizer is held responsible for soil degradation. This is somewhat surprising because the level of use of inorganic fertilizers in the country is still quite low. The reason for adverse impact of chemical fertilizer in the country does not seem to be because of excessive use but because of indiscriminate and non-judicious use. Moving on to the new technology and environmental degradation. Pollution of environment due to the intensive use of chemical fertilizers has become a major problem in the developed countries. In India, environmental degradation in the rural areas has arisen not so much from the high level of chemical inputs used as from deforestation and extension of cultivation to ecologically fragile areas, land saving technological changes by reducing pressure for extension of cultivation and augmenting biomass contribute to the conservation of fragile areas and regeneration of forests. Across different states in India, the extension of areas under cultivation and the denundation of the forest seem to be high where the progress of yield increasing technology is slow. In such regions, the levels of agricultural income and wages are low and poverty levels are high. Similarly, the pressure from animals such as goats and sheep on forest and common lands has been increasing in regions where growth in crop production is slow. This is because the rural poor supplement their incomes 
by rearing their animals. Large scale soil degradation and over exploitation of groundwater are other important factors putting limits on growth of the sector. Around 40% of India's total geographical area are officially estimated as degraded. Some other estimates put the figure at 50%. The emergence of rice wheat crop systems in states like Punjab and Haryana on account of continuous increase in procurement prices has resulted in over exploitation of natural resource space. An ICAR study found that soil health is deteriorating in Punjab and Haryana and this is a major cause of decline or stagnation in productivity of cereals, particularly of rice and wheat. The study revealed that the organic carbon content in the soils of Punjab and Haryana has declined to 0.2% in 1995 from 0.5% in the 60s. Soils with low phosphorus content have also increased to 73% from only 3.5% in 1975 in Haryana. Similarly, soils with high potash category have scaled down from 91% in 1975 to 62% in 1995. Further, consequent to the decontrol of prices of phosphorus and potash, there was decline in the application of these fertilizers. This caused nutrient imbalance in the soils. New farmers have to apply more fertilizers to get the same yield as they are getting with less fertilizer 20 to 30 years ago. In case of groundwater, the study found that the rapid increase in number of tube wells during the last three decades in the region has resulted in over exploitation of groundwater. This decline forces the farmers to lower the pumps further deeper in the wells, which results in the use of irrigation with saline water. The pressing need to accelerate agricultural growth should not be at the cost of sustainability of our natural resources base, which is starkly limited. This is compounded by degradation of soil and overexploitation of groundwater. Deforestation has affected both soils and water. Action on these environmental fronts cannot wait, especially in the face of a possibility looming advanced climate change due to global warming. In recent decades, there has been an increased awareness of the importance of the perspective and practice of ecological agriculture. Proponents of ecological agriculture argue that agriculture cannot function as an isolated system, that is, as having no exchanges of matter or energy with its environment. They argue that agriculture must consider the limits of the natural resources used to produce agriculture commodities as well as the limits of the sinks needed to dispose of the waste from agricultural activities. Others argue additionally that our increasing awareness of ecological systems raises questions about the sustainability of our predominant agricultural paradigm. Now we shall understand about policy suggestions for sustainable agriculture. According to Nina and Chandrasekhar, sustainable agriculture can be achieved by economizing and where possible substituting external with local resources. For instance, legumes in traditional crop rotations were an inexpensive source of nitrogen that is local resource as against expensive synthetic nitrogen that is the external resource. So also organic manures which are less hazardous and expensive and labor intensive have been increasingly discarded over the advent of chemical fertilizers. Research in and development of cost effective technologies. Resource conservation in soil and water conservation shifts to sustainable alternatives that is natural farming, watershed management, biological method of pest control and nutrient use. The accent on resource exploitation that characterized the green revolution based growth strategy has to give place to resource conservation using modern science and traditional wisdom. The strategies for promoting sustained agricultural growth will have to keep in view the diverse environments and constraints under which agricultural growth is taking place. While in the irrigated regions or those with 
plentiful water, emphasis has to be on improving water use efficiency through proper regulation and management, which is very relevant for South and Southeast Asia. In the dry and semi-arid regions, where water apart from land are overriding constraints, the policy goals should aim at moisture and soil conservation and encouraging income enhancing crops, for example, fruit trees and economic activities, for example, pastoral and agroforestry that are less water and land intensive. The problem can be tackled by creating awareness among farmers about proper use of fertilizer and appropriate price structure for various formulations of fertilizer. Another healthy way to take advantage of chemical fertilizer is by using them along with organic fertilizer. There is a lot of wastage and diversion of valuable animal dung. Similarly, lots of agricultural biomass go waste that can be decomposed to produce organic fertilizer. In some parts of the country, like Northwest India, lakhs of tons of rice and wheat straw is disposed of by burning. This not only causes wastage of biomass, but also causes lot of air pollution. Efficient and quick methods for decomposing such biomass would increase availability of organic matter for application in agricultural land. Application of large quantities of pesticides may affect the ecological system adversely in a variety of ways. However, a continuation of current efforts to include genetic pest resistance in plants together with a greater emphasis on biological pest control and proper pesticide handling and application may greatly reduce the environmental risk associated with pest control. According to International Institute of Environment and Development that is IIED, there are some 1.82 million households farming 4.1 million hectare with cleaner chemical free agriculture technologies in 20 developing countries. All have used resource conserving technologies and practicing organic farming. In the US, some 69 large scale farmers had switched over to organic farming by 1980. In India, several farmers are being motivated to shift to organic farming and sustainable agriculture through vermiculture and give up chemical agriculture. A number of villages in the districts of Samastipur, Hazipur and Nalanda in Bihar have been designated to bio-villages where the farmers have completely embraced organic farming by use of earthworms and vermicompost. They have completely given up the use of chemical fertilizers for the last four years since 2005. They are growing cereals like rice, wheat and corn, fruits like banana, guava, mango and lemons and vegetable crops like potato, tomato, onion, brinjal, cucumber, okra etc. on vermicompost. Farmers of bio villages feel proud of their food products and they sell at a higher price in the market due to their good appearance and taste. Let us summarize what we have learnt in this module. Low agriculture productivity and inefficiency arise because of the failure of the factor markets that is land, labor, capital and credit markets. The failure of the markets leads to failure of adoption of new technology necessary for increasing agriculture productivity. Various reasons for low productivity in agriculture are there. The green revolution can be explained clearly by looking at the shift of the production function of any agriculture crops. The phenomena of the GR has indeed been observed by a phenomenal growth of yields of some food grains in parts of India, Pakistan, Thailand, parts of South and Central America and Philippines during the late 60s and 70s. A large number of factors individually and collectively have played roles in varying degrees of importance in making of GR. The continuing high growth rates of population in most LDCs during the 50s and early 60s effectively reduced the growth of per capita real income and per capita food availability. Agriculture must consider the limits of the natural resources used to produce agriculture commodities as well as the limits of the sinks needed to dispose of the waste from agriculture activities. Others argue additionally that our increasing awareness of ecological systems raises questions 
about the sustainability of our predominantly agriculture paradigm. There is a move to search for alternative foods which are more nutritious, cheaper and have shorter harvest cycles. Farm and food policy in India has to change its outlook before there can be a second green revolution.